Hi Year 12, I hope you are well. Today's lesson is focused on sampling in research methods and our lesson goals are to state and outline the sampling techniques in psychology for our AO1 knowledge. We also want to achieve an AO2 application goal of applying our knowledge of sampling using The Simpsons, that is the TV show. And for our AO3, we want to be able to evaluate each sampling technique by listing the strengths and the weaknesses. So we have the sampling, <laughs> that's my cheeky intro for um, our, our makeshift use of the Simpsons characters in illustrating sampling techniques in psychology. So when we carry out research, we need people to take part. These are called participants. It is important to use suitable participants in your study. So we have our first participant here. Hello, I don't know what her name is, but she, she cute with her blue top. <laughs> You have the general population. So the big circle here represents the whole population. So for example, it might represent the entire United Kingdom. And then a sample is a subset of the population. So the population is the group of people from whom the sample is drawn, as a sample is a subgroup of the population. For example, if a sample of 40 participants is taken from Hay School, the population is the whole of Hay School, and the sample would be the 40 students from Hay School that are included in the piece of research. Obviously, it's not usually possible to test everyone in the target population. Therefore, psychologists use sampling techniques to choose people who are representative or typical of the population as a whole. So here we have the example where you've got a, a small sample here and this is the entire population. So it's the idea is that the sample should reflect the general population and that helps with generalizability. So a representative sample is a subset of the target group with a similar distribution of relevant characteristics, in turn allowing us to generalize from the sample to the target group with some justification. So the idea is that if you study a, a small sample, if you include a small sample of the population in your study, because they are representative, if you've worked it out to be representative, then you can generalize your findings back to the population. However, if your sample is unrepresentative, so for example, if you've just got a sample of pure males or just only females, it means that it doesn't reflect the distribution of the characteristics in the target group, so in your wider population, and therefore you can't generalise it to the target population and, and therefore your sample would be biased. So we will now examine some of the techniques used by psychologists to obtain participants for their sample. So at first we've got opportunity sampling and we can see here that the psychologist is asking these fellow participants or prospective participants rather, whether they would want to be in the study. One has said I might as well get involved. One is saying laughing out loud. Opportunity sampling is a sampling technique most used by psychology students and also by psychologists. It consists of taking the sample from people who are available at the time the study is carried out and fit the criteria you are looking for. And then for random sampling. So this is a sampling technique which is defined as a sample in which every member of the population has an equal chance of being chosen. This involves identifying everyone in the target population and then selecting the number of participants you need in a way that gives everyone in the population an equal chance of being picked. So what you do is you put the entire population into a hat and then you pull them out of the hat at random and your random selection will then form your sample for the study. When it comes to random sampling, there are a number of techniques which psychologists and students can use. And it's really important that you know this because this is an area which I've noticed that students fumble on. So if you're asked, how would you conduct a random sample? You wouldn't just give a blase answer of, oh, I'd put, all, I'd put the names in a hat and, um, and that's it. You need to follow up and you need to give us some detail. There's some answers that I've seen which are very, very, very basic, like, oh, yeah, I'd randomly select. But what are you randomly selecting from? So here are a few methods that you 
can use in describing random sampling. And at this point, I would like you to open up to page 193 in your textbook and have a read of the portion which is literally titled Random Sampling Techniques. They are techniques that you would be familiar with. The number one um, technique that you will be familiar with is literally the names into a hat and pulling them out at random. Um, similar to a raffle me method. So remember, if you've ever played in a raffle, if you've ever participated in a raffle, you've been given a number. And sometimes that can be done with a wider population where every person in the population is given a number and then a random number generator generates a number and whoever um, has the number that the, the random number generator has generated, they become part of your sample if they agree to participate in your study. So have a look at page 193 and add to your notes for that. Um, I'm not going to read through this slide because it's very self-explanatory and I've already explained the lottery method. Then we have stratified sampling. Stratified sampling is really important. So you can see that we've got the entire population here. And the entire population is made up of 60% female and 40% male. In stratified sampling, it involves classifying the population into subgroups, strata. And in this case, our subgroups that we've identified are female and male, so gender. And then we choose a sample which consists of the participants from each strata in the same proportions as they occur in the population. So, for example, if we had a sample of 10 individuals for our study, but we want our 10 individuals to reflect the same gender proportions in the wider population, we would need to ensure that indeed the percentage of females in our small sample is 60 percent and the percentage of males in our small sample is 40% because that reflects what is going on in the wider population. And that is stratified sampling. Your strata can be anything. Your strata can be an age group. Your strata can be a profession. The idea is that the proportions must reflect that of the wider population. And then we have systematic sampling. Systematic sampling involves using a predetermined system to select participants from a population, such as selecting every nth person from a phone book, a mailing list, a register, and the numerical interval is applied consistently. So for example, in this situation, I might say that I'm going to select every second individual in this row. And indeed, we apply that consistently. And this means that this individual, this individual, this individual, this individual, and this individual would be part of my study. And if the, the list was going on and on, I would continue selecting every second individual. Then we have volunteer sampling. Volunteer sampling consists of participants becoming part of a study because they volunteer when asked or in response to an advert or an invitation. This is also known as a self-selected sample. There's some responses that you might get. Someone might say it sounds rubbish. Some might say, actually, I can't do it. I've got to do my hair. Some might be super, super helpful. <laughs> and some might, yes, they're, they're interested in being part of a study. Then we have snowball sampling. And this is where one contact will recruit the other contacts to get involved in the research. And the new recruits will go on to recruit more participants. So you can see here, you've got one individual, he's told his two friends, they've gone in and told their um, two other friends, and they've told more people. Yeah, it reminds me of um, a scripture which says, one will chase a thousand and two will chase 10,000. But literally snowball sampling is when you're using word of mouth from the participants. You're using the participants as your resource for reaching out and recruiting more participants. Now onto the strengths and limitations for the sampling techniques. And we'll start off first with opportunity sampling. So the first thing is that this sampling technique is very easy and it's very inexpensive to carry out. If you have the participants readily available, then it means that there's less planning and there's less cost involved with, you know, putting out adverts and so on. 
Limitations is that your sample may not be representative. So for example, let's say you were conducting a study in a city centre during working hours. It means that your sample would not reflect those who have gone into work or those who have gone to school or college. And therefore, you can't generalise your findings to the broader population. And this is problematic because it means that these samples may lack population validity. And then we have random sampling. So one real strength of random sampling is that every member has the same probability of being selected. So there's a reasonable chance of achieving a representative sample, which is ideal. However, a limitation is that sometimes, even in conducting a random sample, you may still get an unrepresentative sample. So your random sampling technique may randomly select all the females in your population, making your study less generalizable to males. And also it can be impractical, it may not be possible to completely random, um, use random sample because you would need to literally get all the members of your population and give them that equal opportunity of being selected. That's similar to literally trying to get the whole of the United Kingdom to be part of a study. You would need to have everyone's details and then you would need to randomly select from those details and it may not be possible to get everyone's details in that manner. And then for stratified sampling, so one real strength is that it avoids the problems of misrepresentation, which can be caused by random sampling. And remember that if you purely use a random sample, sometimes your random sample can randomly select all the females in a population. And that might be problematic for your study because it means that it won't be representative of males. Well, that problem is avoided when you use a stratified sample because you are randomly selecting from the appropriate proportions in the wider population. So if you decide to um, stratify your sample by gender, you'll make sure that the percentage of males and females in your sample are reflective of the wider population. This is positive because it means that your sample would be um, high in population validity and very representative of the wider population. But the limitations are, is that it takes more time and resources to plan. It's problematic because the process is very lengthy in comparison to other sampling techniques and it may cause delay in research. And also care must be taken to ensure that each characteristic present in the population is selected across strata. Otherwise, this will design a bias sample. And then for systematic sampling, so one real strength of systematic sampling is that the method is objective. That means that any subjectivity or any bias from the researcher is removed in the process. But we can only assume that it's objective if the list order has been randomised. So for example, when it comes to registers, we know that um, registers are simply ordered by the um, by in alphabetical order. So therefore, we would consider that to be random. If it was, if registers were organised by ability, then that's not a, a random list. And it could be that even when you're selecting every third person down the list, that your population sample may be somewhat biased. A limitation of systematic sampling is that if the list has been assembled in any other way, then bias may be present. For example, if every fourth person in the list was male, you would have only males in your sample. So there, are, there can be some caveats to systematic sampling. And this is problematic because it means the sample is unrepresentative and it could potentially have a low population validity making it difficult to generalise findings from the sample to the target population. Then we have volunteer sampling. So a strength of volunteer sampling is it often achieves very large sample size through reaching a wide audience, using online adverts and so on. It's quick and it's convenient and it's economical. So it tends to cost very little money in terms of recruiting participants for your study. And it's positive because it means that there's less planning and less preparation required. So it leads to fewer delays in the research process. However, there's a real, real problem with volunteer sampling known as the volunteer bias. And volunteer bias is a form of sampling bias because volunteer participants have special characteristics, such as usually being more highly motivated um, than randomly selected participants. 
Those who respond to the call for volunteers may display similar characteristics such as being more trusting or cooperative than those who did not apply. And it means that you may have an unre a representative sample. So it might be that you've got a, a sample of super helpful and keen people, but it means that your study doesn't tell us anything about those who did not volunteer. And that's problematic in psychology because it means that your study will lack population validity. And then finally, we have snowball sampling. One real strength of snowball sampling is that you are able to identify and contact hard to reach or hidden populations. So let's say your study was on um, perhaps investigating the psychological effects of HIV positive individuals. It might be difficult to put up an advert and ask people to come along um, to take part in your study but if perhaps you um, were able to find one participant and they knew other people who perhaps were HIV positive that would be a way of recruiting another one would be in terms of recruiting those who might be um, engaged in illegal activities apologies for these examples but these are real examples um, in, engaging in illegal activities it's very likely that if you find one participant and use a snowball method they're better able to reach out to those hidden or hard to reach um, other participants to partake in your study it's quicker as referrals make it quick and easy to find participants and the method is also very cost effective but there's a limitation. So we've got another sampling bias. Since people refer those whom they know and have similar traits to, this sampling method can have a potential sampling bias. This means that the sample obtained may not be representative of the broader population. And therefore, this technique is low in population validity. Okay, so to wrap things up for this lesson, I want you to apply your knowledge to sampling um, the different sampling methods that we use in psychology but what I want you to do is not to, to outline the strengths and weaknesses for each sampling method that you identify just simply identify the method as a way of checking your understanding and this is because we've already gone through the strengths and weaknesses in quite great detail so just looking at number one together it says a researcher wishes to study memory in children aged between 5 and 11 he contacts the headmaster of his local primary school and arranges to test the children in the school. So what type of sampling is this? Well, this is opportunity sampling. Yeah, his local primary school, it's likely that the participants or the head teacher would respond favourably and invite him in to conduct the study. So have a go for at doing the rest of them and simply just identify the type of sampling used. So for your submission, all I'm looking to see is one to five and the correct sampling method that has been used in the scenario. So make sure that you complete good notes on this topic. Um, feel free to go back and, and pause where needs be or you would have been pausing as you were watching the video to make your notes. I've also uploaded the PowerPoint as well. Um, and make sure that you submit your answers to the apply your knowledge questions. And ahead of next lesson, you need to buy a packet of mixed coloured sweets. This can be Skittles, Smarties, Haribo, Golden, um, gummy bears, whatever the case may be, just make sure they're mixed in colour um, and I will be back next lesson.